Hi, my name is James Sanderson, and I'd like to discuss today on how do we study with a person from the Jehovah Witnesses. And to, to better study with them is to better understand their beliefs and their doctrines. And so I would like to share that with you today. Now, I am by no means no expert on this, but I have studied with them. I have studied out uh, some of their beliefs, and uh, I'd just like to share those with you today. And just kind of see how well do they match up with the Bible. All right, so this is part one. We're going to have a two-part series on this lesson. And we know the Jehovah Witness. We see their buildings, right? They're called the Kingdom Hall. Um, we have had them come and knock on our doors usually. They're very evangelistic. Uh, I've had uh, several come and, and knock on my door. And I invite them in and we sit down and we study. Uh, they've always been very nice to me. Um, and today I would just like to study their history and their many, many doctrines or teachings or beliefs. And we're just going to be able to cover a few of them because they do have several. So let's start with their history. Jehovah Witnesses originated as a branch of the Bible student movement which developed in the United States in the 1870s among followers of Christian Restorationalist Minister Charles Taze Russell. So this was their leader, okay? And he lived between 1852 to 1916. Bible student missionaries were sent to England in 1881, and the first overseas branch was opened in London in 1900. The group took on the name International Bible Students Association, and by 1914, it was also active in Canada, Germany, Australia, and other countries. The movement split into several um, rival organizations after Russell's death in 1916, with one led by Russell's successor, Joseph Judge Rutherford, retaining control of both his magazines, which you may have heard about, the Watchtower, and his legal and publishing corporation, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania. So when they come and knock on our doors, they usually bring the Watchtower magazine with them. All right, so uh, these are their two leaders. Um, uh, this was their first leader, was Charles Taze Russell, and then to Joseph, uh, Joseph Rutherford. And then today they've been pretty become just known as the Watchtower, which is their headquarters is in New York City. Okay, so they've kind of progressed and grown, um, and their theologies have changed over the years, but this is kind of their history. Under Rutherford's direction, the International Bible Students Associated, Association introduced significant doctrinal changes that resulted in many long-term members leaving the organization. The group uh, regrew rapidly, particularly in the mid-1930s, with the introduction of, the new, of new preaching methods. In 1931, the name Jehovah Witnesses was adopted, further cutting ties with Russell's earlier followers. Substantial organizational changes continued as congregations and teaching programs worldwide came under uh, centralized control. Further refinements of his doctrines led to the prohibition, the prohibition of, um, of blood transfusion. So they prohibited that, okay, by their members. Uh, abandonment of the cross and worship. So they, they were very, they became very against the cross. Uh, they rejected Christmas and uh, celebrating individual birthdays. Um, and the view of a biblical Armageddon as a global war by God destroy the wicked and restore peace on earth. So this is just some of their biblical doctrines that have formatted and even changed over the years. In 1945, the Watchtower Society, which Russell had founded as a publishing house in New York City, New York, amended its uh, charter, uh, charter to state that its purposes included preaching about God's kingdom, acting as a servant and governing agency of Jehovah's Witnesses, and sending out missionaries and teachings for the public worship of God and Jesus Christ. All right, so that's pretty much their history. 
Now today, this is how their their body is governed. Okay, uh, so they have this is their breakdown. So Jehovah God is at the top, and then Jesus Christ is below him, and he's basically the head of the Christian congregation. Uh, and then they have this governing body. Okay, and this governing body consists of well, today these men right below, I think these men are still in place, but that could have changed. Um, and then you've got elders and uh, different congregations and ministerial servants, ministerial servants. Okay, so that's basically the breakdown of their leadership and how they are governed. But everything really comes from this governing body, as the picture below, as you see. All right, so influenced by the uh, <coughs> pyramidal. Medically, pyramidologically, I'm sorry, sorry I can't pronounce that, theories, okay, dealing with the pyramid, and the theology that comes from that, there we go, John Taylor and Charles Smith, Nelson Barber and Charles Russell taught that the great pyramid of Giza, okay, so the pyramids over in Egypt, contained prophetic measurements pyramid inches that pointed to both the year 1847 A.D. and 1914. Russell viewed the Great Pyramid as God's stone witness and prophet. I just catch that. They're saying that a lot of biblical truths are found in the measurements in the pyramids, the Egyptian pyramids. Okay? And they came to believe this. Now, you can see how strong this is. Because today, if you were to go to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and find Charles Russell's, um, where he died at, this is his tombstone, it's actually made in a pyramid. But here's what I want you to catch. Do you see what's on his pyramid? A cross. And yet today, the Jehovah Witness reject the cross. So you see how things change? And how just how outlandish some of their beliefs can come from trying to connect to dates and to years and bringing these years to specific prophecies and certain things were going to happen. And they took this from the pyramids. That is amazing to me. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so this is a big year for them. The year 1914 AD. This is a big year for the Jehovah Witnesses. Now the question is, where do they come? Where do they get that, that year from? And how do they arrive at it? Well, it comes from the book of Daniel. Right now here at, at uh, Brown Street Church of Christ, we're actually studying the book of Daniel. And it comes out of chapter 4, and it comes out of one verse, chapter 4, verse 23. It's called the seven times. All right? Now, let me just share the verse with you. Let me read it to you. It says, you, O king, saw a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump, bound with its iron, bronze, and the grass of the fields, while its roots remain in the ground, let him, him, this is a person, be drenched with the dew of heaven, let him, a person, live like the wild animals, how long? until seven times pass by for him. I'm talking about a person here. Okay? Now, the question is, what is Daniel chapter 4 talking about? Well, let's find out. Here's the context of Daniel chapter 4. In Daniel chapter 4, King Nebuchadnezzar, he is having a pride problem. He, God has put him in place. He's over the king the kingdom of Babylon, and he just gets up one day and walking over his city and saying, boy, how great this city is, and look what I've done, look what I've done, look what I've done. Then he has a dream, and he has this dream about this great big tree and all the birds of the air come and feed on it, right? But then this dream, it really bothers him. In the dream, the tree is cut down. But there's a stump left. Now, this is the kingdom being taken away. 
Now, how do we know that? Because what's going to happen is when you read this chapter, Daniel is going to come in, right? He's going to interpret this dream for him, tell him what the meaning is. And so what happens is, is he was great. and He had this big, great kingdom, the tree. But then it's going to be cut down and his kingdom is going to be taken away. Why? Because he has a pride problem. God is going to bring him down low. Then what's going to happen is he's going to be humbled. He's going to go out and actually eat grass like a wild animal. Now, when we go and we look at Babylonian history, and we actually look at King Nebuchadnezzar, it's ironic that for a period of years, the man just disappeared. There's just nothing said about him. Now, watch what God is wanting to happen to him. This is what Daniel says. He's, he says, <clears throat> when he's interpreting the dream, you will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. <coughs> Excuse me. You will eat grass like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until, watch this, you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of the men and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored. But when will it be restored? When you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what's right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. And it may be that then your prosperity will continue. Now, how long is this going to take? Well, the Bible says seven times. So from this verse, from this one little word, seven times, the Jehovah Witness has come and made an entire theology out of this. And I want to show you what they did with this chapter. Now, again, we've already looked at the context. Context means everything. You must, if you're going to be a good Bible student, stay with context. That's the context. But watch what the Jehovah Witness did. How do they handle Daniel chapter 4? Well, let me show you. They believe the seven times in Daniel chapter 4 verse 23 equals 2,520 literal years and point to the year 1914 A.D. And I want to show you, this is how they produce that equation. Okay, so get ready. Just watch what they do. They take the seven times in Daniel chapter 4, which was clearly talking about King Nebuchadnezzar, right? And him getting his kingdom restored back to him, right? And they turn it into a math equation. And here's the equation. Seven times 360. Okay, seven times. So there you see the number seven. You got it? Okay. They're going to take 360. The way they produce 360 is by taking the days of a Jewish calendar, and they use that by using Revelation 11, 2, verse 3, chapter 12, verse 6, and chapter 14 in support of their year or, or their view. So one year equals 360 days. Okay. So 7 times 360. Then they turn the 360 days and make them into years. And they use Ezekiel 4, 6 and Numbers 14, 34 in support of their view. So they take 7 times 360 equals 2,520 2, years. Okay? Now what does that have to do with the book of Daniel? What does that have to do with Daniel chapter 4? I have no idea, but let's keep going. Next, they use as a starting time or a starting point for this equation. And they pick the year 607 BC. Okay. Believing that this was when the Babylonian Empire destroyed Israel and the temple. So the kingdom was being taken away, right? Remember what happened to King Nebuchadnezzar? His kingdom was being taken away until he would acknowledge that God ruled the world and then it would be given back to them well 
What does it have to do with Israel? What does it have to do with Israel uh, losing their kingdom? Well, see, they're trying to make an analogy here. But does the Bible do that? And, and second of all, they, they picked the year 607 B.C. They are way off in their math because it is just an absolute fact that it was not until 586 B.C. That, that Nebuchadnezzar came in and destroyed the temple. So they're off by like, man, 30 some years here. OK, but let's just stay with their math. After they take the 607 B.C. and add 2,520 years to it, it produces the year 1914. So 607 B.C. plus 2,520 years, you land at 1914 A.D. Now, what do they believe happened? Well, what happened in 1914 AD, or this is what they taught, according to their beliefs, is Jehovah entrusted rulership over mankind to his son, Jesus Christ, glorified in the heavens. And they used Daniel 7, 13, and 14 in support of this view, which, again, is taken totally out of its context. So according to them, this is the year Jesus started ruling, the kingdom being restored. Wait a minute. Do you remember this verse over here, Matthew? Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Jesus is talking to his apostles in what year? About 29 AD. This is about the year that he died, was buried, was raised. He says to his apostles, all authority has been given unto me. When? When did that happen? In 29 AD, not 1914 AD. They're off almost 2,000 years. Somebody has missed the boat here. Okay? So you can see this, okay? And you can see this map here, this chart, this timeline of what they used to bring them to 1914. Okay, now, here's a problem. They also taught that in 1914, that the world would come to an end. There would be the great Armageddon, there'd be a great battle, the world would come to an end, Jesus would come and start ruling, and peace would be on the earth in 1914. Well, do you remember what happened in 1914? It's called World War I. Huh. And that was anything but uh, peace on earth, okay? So what they did was they had to modify. And once Jesus didn't come, they had to change the year. So what they did was they changed the year to 1915. Then they changed it to 1918. Then they changed it to 1925. And then they said, okay, since we've seen we're off, what we're going to do is we're going to change that theology. And we're going to say, no. Jesus is going to come back within that generation. So that means that before the people of that generation all die off, Jesus will return. Now, I want you to see, this is a copy of the Watchtower. And it has 1914. And then they started teaching that this generation would never pass away. Now, these are real people here, and they're all Jehovah Witness people. Now, we don't mean any disrespect to these people, but it lists all of their names and it shows when all of them died. All of those people are gone. That generation is gone. And guess what, folks? The world has not come to an end and Jesus has not returned. And there is, well, watch the news. There is not peace on earth, is there? So this is a prophecy that they made. Now, Here's all kinds of different prophecies that they've made, okay? And you can see the different years, okay? Uh, if, if you look down at uh, 1942, and then they changed to 1950, they taught that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would literally return to earth. They even built a house for them because they were going to return to earth. Well, guess what? 1942 went by, and then they changed to 1950, and they didn't, they didn't return, and so they just stopped talking about it. And then they taught in 1975 that Armageddon would begin. They put another year to this. There'd be a thousand year reign and the 144,000 would go to heaven. This is again some of their theology. 
Do you know they lost over a million members that year because that didn't happen? Again, prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. And I've got to tell you, these are just a small amount of the many prophecies they've had. But when you look at them all, here's what you find. These are just a few of the hundreds of prophecies that have been made by the Jehovah Witnesses that have never come to pass. In fact, when you look at all of their prophecies, and I've seen them, I've just seen list and list and list and list and list. Their track record is zero. Zero. Absolutely zero. Not one prophecy, not one thing that they ever predicted to happen, ever came true. Hmm. That's amazing, isn't it? Now, what do you say? What, what, what do they say about false prophecy? What do what does what does the Jehovah Witness say when somebody comes along and makes predictions that does not come true? What do they say about that? Well, I'm just going to share with you what their Watchtower books say. Okay, and this is what it says. This is Watchtower, May 1930, page 154 to 155. Since the Bible was completed and inspiration is no longer necessary, a true prophet is one who is faithful, faithfully proclaiming what is written in the Bible. You see that? A true prophet. But it may be asked, how do we know whether uh, one is a true prophet or false prophet? There are at least three ways by which we can positively, positively decide. Number one. If he is a true prophet, his message will come to pass exactly as prophesied. If he's a false prophet, his prophecy will fail to come to pass. This rule is laid down by God himself through Moses as follows. So you go back to the book of Deuteronomy, and they're going to quote two, two passages here. Out of the book of Deuteronomy, this is what it says. Uh, they're going to use the King James Version here, I believe. If thou say in thou, thou heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has spoken? How do we know if it's true or not? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follows not, nor comes to pass, that is a thing that the Lord has not spoken, but the prophet has spoken presumptuously. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20 through 21. So they were asking the same question back in the book of Deuteronomy, the Israelites were. And this was the answer from God. Now you go over to chapter 13, verse 5, it says, That prophet shall be put to death because he has spoken to turn away from the Lord your God. This is their publication. This is what they printed. So when a prophet prophesies something, or a false prophet, I should say, prophesies something, and it doesn't come true, it's not from God, and they're saying they ought to be put to death. Okay? Now what have we seen so far from the Jehovah Witness? What have they prophesied? Lots and lots of things. Not one of them has come true. Here's another publication. This is from the Awake publication. It's also from the Jehovah Witness. In October 8, 8, 1968. True, there have been those who predicted an end of the world, even announcing a specific date. They did, yes. Some have gathered groups of people with them and fled to the hills or withdrawn to their houses, waiting for the end. Yeah, nothing happened. The end did not come. They were guilty of false prophesying. Why? What was missing? Missing was the full measure of evidence required in fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Missing from such people were God's truth and the evidence that he was guiding and using them. That's what does Jehovah Witness say? Yeah, that's right. I would totally agree with those people. Yes. And yet, everything they've said is a lie. And here's the Watchtower, April 1972, just a few years before they declared that the world was going to come to, end, to an end in 1975. So does Jehovah have a prophet to help them? To warn them of dangers and to, to, to declare things to come? He has a prophet to warn them. This prophet was not one man but was a body of men and women. It was the small group of footstep followers of Jesus Christ, known at that time as International Bible Students. Today they are known as the Jehovah's Christian Witnesses. 
what do they declare? We're it. We're the prophets from God. Of course, it's easy to say that this group acts as a prophet of God. It's another thing to prove it. The only way this can be done is to reveal their record. And what does it show? What does their record show? Zero. They have not made one prophecy that ever came true. That means that they have lied and lied and lied and lied to people. Do you know who the first liar was on this earth? It was Satan. He was a liar. He, in fact, Jesus calls him the father of lies. What does Jesus call the truth? And his word is true. Those are two opposite things. Folks, we are trying to find the truth of God's word. This world is trying to find truth. It has been lied to over and over and over again. And there is so much hypocrisy out there in this religious world. And we're just trying to find the truth. I have nothing personally against these people. But I am going to take their doctrine and see if it matches up with the Bible. And if it does not, then we need to kick it out and, no, and have nothing to do with them. And so far, how does it match? It doesn't match very well, does it? If you're studying what the job is, by sharing this information with them, we need to share it what? We need to share it in love. And here's what's going to happen. This is what I'm hoping to happen. That it may just cause them to question what they have been taught. That maybe what I have been taught is not the truth. And then we can lead them like John chapter 8 verse 31 and 32 says. What did Jesus say? The truth will set you free. And where does Jesus say truth is found? Thy word is truth. I hope this has helped you today. I hope this has helped you to uh, learn some things, to, to maybe see our religious world and, and not everything that is taught out there is true. And so that we can continue to find where that truth lies and is found in God's word. Pray for these people, get to know their religion, get to know their beliefs so that when they come and knock on our door, that we can invite them in and lead them to the truth of God's word. You be praying for them. You be praying for yourself. I hope this has helped. This is just part one in our series. We're going to have another uh, part two uh, coming up, and I'll finish that here real soon. So I hope you stay with us, and I pray that this was helpful for you. Uh, love you, and uh, we'll see you next time.